Like always? Everybody? Oh, now, or... see, now I'm going to have to do some editing on this. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Welcome to the collective, everybody. Good to see you. I am very excited about today's episode. We have all kinds of awesome things going on. We got Steve joining us. We got Gordo here. We got Taryn here and Sean joining us as always. Very excited about this. Now, if y'all are excited as I am, which you should be, make sure you're liking the show. Hit the subscribe, uh, the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, do all that good stuff. Get your emails in the morning when we go live because... It's an awesome show. So can't wait to get this started. Let's get some intros out of the way. Uh, Steve, I'm going to start with you. Give us a quick 10 to 15 seconds. Who are you? Where I come from? All that good stuff. Uh, up. My name is Steve Seeker, um, at Seven Pillars on Instagram. Uh, I am currently, I'm a screenwriter, uh, former military, former Marine. Uh, uh, got a law enforcement background, retired homicide detective as well. Um, yeah, that's me. I'm living, living the life down here in San Diego, uh, just wearing flip-flops and eating fish tacos. Dang, hard life down there, let me tell you. Gordo, how about yourself? Yeah, I'm out here in Moncton eating like clams, fried clams and being cold. Like, damn, dude, way to rub it in. Uh, former former CSOAR operator in uh, JTAC. Uh, I just graduated graphic design, got my fingers and quite a few things within the veteran community. So trying to spread uh, the good word and uh, trying to build a clothing brand at the same time. Lots of stuff. Um, long walks on the beach and uh, $1.50 Costco hot dogs. Those Maybe. Are, no? those now you're those talking. Are now you're yeah. talking. You I, just, I've you just, many of those. You, you just, you just, <laughs> you just, you just trump my fish tacos. Right here. Sean's like dying on the inside. He's like, <laughs> what? He's like, it's not, it's not case and protein. Uh, <laughs> well, before we get too far into that one, Taryn, how about yourself? Just take a little intro. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my name's Taryn. I'm an Army veteran, um, former Team Canada skeleton athlete, uh, current national rugby athlete, and uh, I'm in university doing a policy degree. Hopefully get a law degree afterwards. And uh, yeah, just trying to help raise awareness as well with uh, the veteran community. Uh, it helped found uh, Wayfinder Wellness, which is here in Cochrane, um, which pretty much services all of Southern Alberta for veterans and first responders that just need a place to kind of go and, and relax and decompress with other like-minded individuals. Yeah. yeah. Wayfinder is awesome. I know, all the, I know all the troops down there. They're a great team of people. Sean, how's life in the mountains? Well, I'm not going to make any comparisons to fish tacos and hot dogs. So I'm just going to say good to be here. Looking forward to the convo. Awesome. We are going to get this started right now. So the general idea I had for today was creatives. We are all here. We're, we're all people that create things on a regular basis. We all try to help out where we can, and we all try to come up with interesting solutions to problems that we see in the, in the community, especially the veteran community. Um, but I'm going to ask you guys one initial question on this, and that is, how do you use your creativity in your life right now? How, how do you create your life in this moment gordo you're on top i'm gonna start with you what do you think uh i would say it's everything i'm living it it's how i structure my life structure but it's not structure because when i have things organized and planned and things are hitting their markers and i'm feeling like a flow in life then that is creativity so it's it's always going with me. It's constant. I love it. I like that. Steve, how about yourself? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, for me, obviously, being creative, that's a huge part of what I do for a living now. Um, but I th it's interesting what Gordo said, like in terms of living your life, um, all of us have come from very structured backgrounds, right? And very disciplined backgrounds. So we all have that kind of, in there, but, but through my creative processes, I've learned to kind of be a little less, um, outcome oriented, uh, and, and more flow oriented, right? Like enjoying the moment, enjoying the process and focusing and, and realizing that big accomplishments are always, you know, it's just like selection or whatever, right? It's always, um, you know, one day at a time, one foot in front of the other. It's always a, a big thing is uh, a collection of a lot of small victories, right? 
Um, so yeah, that's kind of, kind of how that works into my life. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I like it. Taryn, how about yourself? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I need, de- I need, I need deadlines. I need to have some sort of pressure <laughs> imply, uh, implemented on myself before my creativity really likes to flow. So for me, I have to put a deadline and I need to have a, you know, uh, a hard fast goal in, in mind for my for me to get myself motivated to be creative um and it just helps me flow better when i feel a little more pressure and a little more um, time constraint i still do enjoy the moment and what i'm doing and in, in, in that space but yeah for me i just definitely i need a little more pressure to get me to <laughs> to react a little bit better it, it always helps to have just a little bit of pressure sean what are your thoughts on this <laughs> speaking of pressure um so creation when when i was younger i didn't think i was a creator i didn't think i was that creative but upon reflection i guess i was because i am now and and i know it for sure because i'm kind of literally every single day holding myself back from creating more content or being more creative more appropriately not creating content for the masses but just creating like I I want to take photos of everything. I want to take video of everything. I want to write about everything. I want to sit down and ponder everything. I want to write a poem about everything. It's weird what's going on with me right now. I've gone full creative. And so I guess the thing that I'd like to put out there as my first thought is at, at one point in my life, I wasn't creating that much. I was doing but I wasn't creating. Now I'm doing and creating, and I'm finding it extremely satisfying. And so as I've created more and more, stuff that nobody will ever see, stuff that only I need to see, as I create more and more, I enjoy the process more and more, and I wanna put out there that whether you're creating or whether you're being creative, only 10% in your life, or 100% in your life. Just know that it's not a fixed percentage. As you get older, perhaps it will ebb and flow as life does, and your creative juices will increase or reduce. But just know that the joy in life is creating, I believe, not just doing. Everyone does, and it doesn't leave a mark, but doing and creating leaves a mark. So. Let's see where the conversation goes. I, I like I like this this beginning portion here because it's going where I was hoping it would. And my uh, initial question on this is the fact of when did you realize that you were creative in general? When did you come to a, uh, a light bulb moment like, man, I can create things on my own and I can just do it without without any added, like somebody standing over you saying, draw a picture of a panda. You don't, you don't need that. You can just, oh, you know what? I feel like drawing right now. And for myself, it was as young as I remember, I've been creating things. I've been always wanting to build stuff. I've been wanting to draw stuff. I've been wanting to uh, draft things. Like anytime I got an opportunity where I could be creative in my own space, I loved it. And I'm wondering what do you, where, where or when did that kick in for you? Steve, I'm gonna start with you. What do you think? Yeah, I think um, from a very young age, I had always uh, been doing creative writing for myself. Uh, that was something that I enjoyed to do. Uh, I'm a voracious reader, always reading things. Um, but much like Sean, I, I I never considered myself creative. I never considered myself, well, I'm, I'm not that guy or that person, right? Um, and spent a lot of time doing things or setting a goal. I'm going to, you know, Roger that tighten down my ruck straps and I'm going to go accomplish that goal. Right. So I'm doing things right. And now when, when I left law enforcement and had an opportunity to work in the entertainment industry and I started getting around people that, that tell stories um, and, and are, in 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 a bunch of different ways whether they write or they tell them visually or or however they do that whatever part of the process they are uh you know 
I started really, it really resonated with me. And that's kind of, and, and I was sitting in a writer's room and working alongside with other writers. And I was not yet a writer, um, but I was bringing, you know, my military and law enforcement experience to the story and helping develop a story. Um, and I just got involved in that process. And I'm like, hey, man, like, I, like I can do this. Like, what am I? I'm, I'm looking at these people around the conference table, and I'm like, I, they're as much of a knucklehead, if not more of a knucklehead, than I am. So, like, I have stories to tell, uh, and I'd like to take a crack at at uh, telling them. Um, and when I when I reached out to my mentor in the business, um, and he kind of guided me along the way of writing my first script when I actually created something and it's something nobody's i mean maybe a handful of people have ever read nobody's ever gonna buy nobody's ever gonna make it um but i remember that experience the day that i finished that right the day i had 100 pages on it the day that i finished that i was it was just me in my office nobody else uh nobody there to see nobody to cheer me on nobody to pat me on the back i felt but i felt great i mean uh, that was, and I'm like, I can do this. And I am a creative, I'm a storyteller. And this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to be a writer. So I love that. Yep. That's fantastic. Taryn, yeah. what are you thinking? Can you repeat the question for me? <laughs> yes. The, the question is, when did you realize that you were a creative person? Or when did you, were, was there a moment that you all of a sudden realized? Or has it always just been that you enjoyed creating? Okay, right. Um, yeah, there was a specific time when I was in high school. Um, there were, used to be, I don't know if it's still a thing for high school and secondary uh, education, but there used to be a thing called Skills Canada, which was a uh, more of like a trade, trades driven um, competition for high schoolers and, and, and secondary. And uh, I met this kid in high school who was super uh, into making videos and um, and back then that was like, you know, <laughs> that wasn't just as easy as it is today. So he, he really showed me the ropes and we entered this competition, Skills Canada. And um, I had a, my chemistry teacher at the time who was kind of our mentor for this competition, um, where basically they give you five envelopes that are closed on the table. You pick an envelope. It has a topic uh, and you have 12 hours that day to shoot, script, edit. Uh, and produce um, a short video that's one to two minutes long. Um, we took we took second place in in uh, in the competition, and it was just kind of one of those moments where I truly felt like I was I, I had some sort of creativity that I didn't know previous to to uh, to entering this competition or meeting these uh, my friend and um, you know having this teacher. I had no idea that I had that kind of creativity in me. And again, that comes back to the pressure I spoke about earlier. Uh, that 12 hours was, that was, it seemed like a long time, but that 12 hours was a lot of pressure and, and it really just um, got my creativity flowing. It was such a cool experience for me as a looking back at it um, to kind of have an aha moment of like, oh, okay, I like to do this. Now everyone's a creator uh, or everyone's, you know, editing and, and shooting their, their footage. Everyone is doing it. So I think now even more so having been doing that for so long um, and seeing everyone else doing the same thing now, I think that's very encouraging. And that's kind of where also that creativity I pull from is just everyone is doing it and leading by example, really. Everyone's just trying to be a creator these days, which, um, you know, probably 10 years ago, you kind of made fun or scoffed at that individual but you know now everyone is doing it and i think that's probably one of the bigger reasons i'm I'm so creative now where i try to be is because i see everyone's doing it so it's uh kind of that group think mentality that sort of sort of say yeah absolutely gordo where are you coming to on this i wrote down like two weeks ago is when i finally was like yeah yeah, that's right. I, I think I am a creative person. And my wife's just like, what's wrong with you, dude? Like I built this house that we're in. I built like all this crazy stuff. I've been doing that my whole life. 
I, in the military, like love range car, not love range cars, but like good recce stuff. I was always doing map sketches. I had some sick sketches that are up in the hill. Uh, just always, always working at like improving the OP. If it's urban, like setting up stuff, working with guys, cleaning it, making it better. And you don't think that's creative, but it was all, it always was. And it, it clearly it wasn't like stymied by the military, but just the focus wasn't there. And now that I'm out and I could be creative all the time. And now graphic design has kind of unlocked it for me where it's shown me, Hey man, you can do this and you are doing it. But it really didn't set in until about two weeks ago when I said that out loud and I'm like reflecting on the art that I've produced and just like Taryn said, the, the creativity part, like I'm talking to a camera that's hooked up to a laptop that's hooked up to a light and the microphone and everything. And uh, it feels good to own it. It feels good to say, yeah, that's, that is what I do. It's, it's a passion and it's with good, with good stuff to talk about and the things that I'm interested in it, it works out really well. I, I figured out my why a couple years ago with some help and I didn't truly understand it, but I like creating something whether that's a piece of art or a t-shirt that feels good or a, or a house and i show something i show it to someone and they go like wow that's cool and then i get my fix off of like that reaction so and i didn't know what that meant back then and this is what i'm talking about like two years ago which shows how long the transition is when you're leaving the military and to now sit where i'm at and be like no that's okay that that is your why and on top of it like you can uh you can make money from it so it's cool i like it yeah absolutely started two weeks ago there you go <laughs> nice nice and early it's still fresh in the memory that's the good key right there sean how about yourself yeah i'm with gordo in this in this uh particular moment because just like himself i remember a time when i was on my uh, army sniper course and uh drawing out the sketch of the day in my OP. And <clears throat> at the time, I didn't think I could draw. I still don't think I can draw. But I look at those things, and they're good drawings, man. Like, they have good perspective. They have good range. They have good, they have good understandability. Not just for me, but for my sniper partner or for whoever. Like, they're good freaking drawings, man. But I didn't see the, it that way. And here's why. Because <laughs> I've got the wickedest imposter syndrome on the entire intergalactic sphere. And so there's no way I would believe that I was a good drawer. Uh, but uh, also, I think problematically, no one ever said I was a good drawer. Like, in that moment, as I'm doing a pretty good drawing, a sniper instructor is not sauntering over with a bunch of spare time on his hands to say, Good job, Sergeant Taylor. What an amazing drawing. No one ever said that. And so I was validated in lots of different ways throughout my military career. I've been validated in a bunch of different ways through my other civilian or veteran careers. <clears throat> but it's always been for things that have been less about being creative and more about that was a freaking kick-ass moment that just occurred. And so it's the recognition of the trophy moments that I typically get from others. But I never really got any of the tiny feedback like, hey, man, just keep on pursuing drawing. You're pretty good at it. So to Gordo's point, I've got some range cards that used to be pretty freaking epic. The house that I'm sitting in, I designed myself, though I don't think of myself as a designer. When someone comes over and sits down in our home theater and says, well, it sounds really good in here. I might say to them, yeah, because I audio engineered the 11.1 .1 speaker system in here so that it sounds perfect where you're sitting right now because of the following. And until someone hits me with that, I don't think of these things. I just get on with my life, creating, but not thinking of myself as a creator. And so Chance Burles had said to me a little while ago, you're totally a content creator. And I was like, what? shut up, man. Don't insult me that way. And so it took me quite a while to pick up what he was putting down, like not own the title, but accept the title. So I accepted the title of I'm creating some content. But it's taken me since Chance threw that in my face. It's taken me all of that time to come to terms with 
in my head, I've got to say, I'm not a content creator. I'm just creative. And so to my earlier point, nowadays, because I'm letting the creative part of me unfold, it's gaining velocity. It's gaining momentum. And in the past, I would have shut that down because I would have been busy with other things. But now, it's, it's my life to live at 60, it's kind of retired to some degree. So I can freaking let her go, man, in any direction that I want. And so I'm now, weirdly, encouraging myself to let her rip, let it go, freaking smash on being creative. To my point, this morning, <clears throat> as I try to do every Thursday now, I don't know how these things start. I started a Thursday garbage video where every Thursday when I rolled the garbage out to the end of the driveway, I, I video myself rolling it out. And then as I'm walking back to the camera, at one point months ago, I decided I was going to do something not epic, but something that would be fun for the troops when they watch the Thursday garbage video. Well, today, as I was walking back to the camera, I, I had a total blank. I had no idea. I just kicked off my freaking little red elf shoes and did a jumping front snap kick in Thursday's throat, right in the throat Thursday. And do you know what I got? I got DMs from people who stated, hey, man, I love Thursday. I can't wait to see what you're going to do on Thursday garbage morning. And it's fun. So I don't put out the creation for the people who are looking forward to it. I put up goofy, it's like punching holes in pumpkins in your garage, like some sort of weird Hollywood movie where you're hanging out with your bro Hemo trying to be a badass, but you're not. That's kind of the life I'm living right now is freaking the gong show of fun. But letting it, ha letting it be fun is fun for me now. Whereas there was a time in my life that this would have been a, a, an alien thought process for me. So I'm just throwing it out there that if no one's encouraging you to have fun with your creativity, I'm freaking encouraging you to do so. Mm, that's a great point. Now, I have, it, it's interesting you bring this up too, because the idea of being creative, coming from the military especially, or, you know, typically masculine dominated type uh occupations, creativity is almost seen as childish or perhaps feminine, right? Like there's, it's not really discussed. It's not really openly uh, brought up, being like, oh, you know what? You need to be creative. Oh, you, you should you use that creativity more often when you're sitting in a defensive structure, right? Even though it is, it's just not called creativity. It, you know, it's, you should always be improving your defensive system. You should always be finding, finding work. That takes creativity. But do you think it has to do more with perhaps the environment that we come from? Because I know like growing up, my mom, she's a hippie, right? <laughs> Creativity was consistently and almost aggressively put in our lives at an early age. Like we should be creative. We And it was actively pushed that we should be more creative than uh, than not. And I know a little bit about your background, Sean, in terms of that there probably wasn't a whole lot of creativity uh, when you were young <laughs> or it wasn't pushed as much, but how much was it for you guys growing up? Was it developed or was the environment conducive to being creative or was it more restrictive? Taryn, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, I think, so I, I joined the reserves when I was 16. So I had a little bit of creativity <laughs> and I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I, I want to go back to that first. I agree with what, um, I, you're 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 restrained or almost constrained in in the environment of being in the military to some extent, given the, the nature of our specific jobs. Um, it, it's not like, hey, like, who wants to be creative today? You know, those questions don't come out there. You don't get the opportunity. I've had one opportunity, and that was when I was um, on the hundredth anniversary for uh, for PCLI's uh, drumline we got you know that was the first time where i felt like i could actually where i got a little bit of creativity and i got to be a little bit more myself um and and um but outside when i left or bef sorry before I, I joined the military um i th i think it really wasn't pushed on myself as much as i i now at you know being 36 in hindsight i i wish 
I had that somebody to push me into being creative with my own kids right now. Like I I'm giving them every option. Uh, I don't care if they say no to it. I just want them to try it because I want them to get their creativity. So I never really had that as a, as growing up, my, my father really wasn't really like, you know, let's, let's sit down and like you said, draw a panda today or, or what do you want to do? My, my dad was, uh, I grew up in Newfoundland, rural Newfoundland. So, you know, we, saw dad for a while but he was mostly gone to fort mcmurray or he was working somewhere uh on the mainland and he came home you know once or twice uh every few months hung out and then went back once once work was there so i really didn't get the creativity that i wish i would have had when i was a kid and then when you go to the military like you said chance um you don't really get the opportunity to to explore your creativity not in the given jobs that we we were a part of uh but I also think there are there's uh, sometimes when you're in the military and you see, uh, let's say like the the photo tech or the or the band comes in and you're like, man, that would be a kick ass job. It's kind of like a little bit of you, or at least for myself, it was like, man, that seems cool because you just get to be creative. Um, so there were jobs in the military that I thought, oh, I've got the cool job, but that seems like a really interesting job they get to kind of be a little more themselves and express themselves in a different way um yeah so to sh yeah to answer that question i just wish i never really had it as as much as i wish i would have had it when i was growing up yeah yeah, yeah totally makes sense steve thoughts on this yeah i think um I, I like my mother was fairly creative like she taught she, she would sew and quilt and macrame and all this kind of stuff she was very much into that so i saw that from her um but i i grew up in pittsburgh um steel town hard working town you know blue collar work ethic like it that ain't paying the bills kid you know and uh my dad uh was a mechanic owned his own garage um and so so i don't while while i saw that creativity um it was you know it, it was not seen as like well yeah that's that's sweet that's that's nice but like you're a man like you've got work to do like we've got stuff to do that pays the bills and puts meat on the table and this is this is how you need to be living your life and i mean i'm thankful for all of that work ethic and uh, and discipline, self-discipline and all that sort of stuff, um, that I got. Um, but I certainly would have, it, it would have been interesting if I would have explored that creativity a little earlier in life and, and seen where that took me. But, um, you know, then again, uh, having the life that I've had, you know, being in the organizations I've been in and things like that, they, make me a better storyteller now so it's probably all how it was supposed to be so. yes indeed gordo what are you thinking uh yeah so i played a lot of guitar growing up a lot of music in the household never any drawing i still suck at drawing some people are like wow that's good a really good drawing but it'll take me a really really long time to do it and it's it's still not that good um compared to people that can just whip it up um but it reminded me of like i don't think the school system i don't think i really understood i've said now that i've done graphic design that if i was shown this in high school if i knew about it i think it would have been something i would have pursued i just went like kind of like more meathead route and stuff but i didn't know that i would like it this much so i wrote down like school system i don't think the school system had a good job of like translating that what jobs you could get from doing art i don't know or maybe it's just I wasn't paying attention to it. I agree with Taryn about the, the image tech thing. Every time I would see an image tech, I'm like, damn, that must be so nice to get out of their truck and they're all dry. I'm like, cool. What kind of lens is that? <laughs> um, and then it's, I agree. I, I dis, okay. I disagree with your point about how the military, uh, isn't creative. Like I, there was something about, when you were when you stepped off at the beginning of your sentence or your point on creativity within it it's just i don't think recognized but like 
in the sense of how important it is if you're mission planning or if the operation is going on, then obviously like it's kind of more important, but the subliminal conversations that you have with the guys, when you see guys doing what they're doing and their thought process and how creative they actually are, that is like, I only realize now that I probably won't get the same um, in working environment where I'm going to have that many high, high level people all working at the same time. But more importantly was there was so much creativity going on guys, skateboarding, painting, the music that guys were playing, the thought process, like philosophy, I guess, thinking the thinking man, that's all created creativity. So in the traditional sense of like meathead army, yes, there's not creativity, but I, f you felt it. It just was never spoken of. Yeah, absolutely. And I 100% hear you. There's lots of points on that one. We're going to get to that in a second. Sean, what do you think on this? So um, creativity, I suppose I was being creative when I was a kid. I just didn't see it. Uh, and I say kid, like I started playing piano when I was maybe about eight years old, played it for about 10 years or just under 10 years. And uh, along the way, I played every freaking school band instrument, except the cool ones, which are guitar and drum, which sucked as a kid. Uh, because, you know, there's no dating involved if you're not playing guitar. So um, I was creative with instruments and I liked writing. So I was creative with writing, but I just didn't think of myself as creative. But I'm going to tell you the first time I realized that I liked being creative and I'd just been enabled for the first time to be creative, at least the standout moment for me. So I need my stage prop, which fortunately I always keep nearby. So here's the stage prop. It's an old schooly Gerber boot knife. And uh, I've had this a freaking long time, man. And so the beauty of this blade, other than this, the fact that it's razor sharp, it's just got a beautiful dagger tip on it. It's, it's really quite precise as a, as a tool. And so I wore that everywhere very early in my military career. I liked knives. I liked having knives on me. And so I was the guy who always uh, broke all the rules by having the knives that weren't issued. And so I'd wear that in my boot, wherever, out in the bush, when we were doing whatever we were doing. I had it on me all the time, either hidden or not. And I used to get a lot of heat for it. But if we were, if we were doing something that wasn't on a parade square, I was freaking wearing it. And eventually everyone just got used to it and just put up with me. And so um, here's where the creative piece worked. Here's where I realized that I'd just been enabled to do whatever the heck I want. Because the guy who was running our uh, Canadian Airborne Regiment unarmed combat team trusted me, he said, hey, we need a sequence. And so why don't you create your own sequences? And I said, oh, I get to do whatever I want. Like I can do flying sidekicks. I can use knives. I can, yeah, you can do it all. I was like, oh, baby. And so we started putting together a sequence of events where at one point in front of a large audience, I had this to my partner's neck and tore out his, tore out, quote, unquote, his throat, which was just basically a condom full of fake blood that he had wrapped around his neck, around his throat, and then just a little thin green cloth that we used to use for arm slings. That was just hiding the condom full of blood. And as I rolled forward, covered his nose and mouth, put the knife to his throat and tore it out and sprayed the crowd with blood, I thought, geez, I hope I didn't kill him, but that was pretty rad. And so the army allowed me to do something that I finally realized I get to do this. And that moment has stood out for me forever. I've got a photo of me basically reaping out his throat in front of the audience. And it looks pretty rad. But um, being allowed to do something, quote unquote, that dangerous was uh, felt like someone had taken off the um, the governor. It felt like someone had taken off the shackles that were limiting me. 
the moment that I got to do that, it really expanded my world to something much, much bigger than it had been the day before. And so I got to thank the military for letting me cut a guy's throat out in front of a crowd to help me understand that the moment that you're enabled to do rad things, well, now you know that you can do a second rad thing and a third rad thing. And it's called out of the box thinking. And it's called do good work that maybe no one else is thinking of doing and see how it all plays out. That is the moment that I started branching out like that. The moment that I held this to a guy's throat. So it is a standout moment for me. And not all creativity revelations requires you to like slice a condom open. Oh my God. Don't put that on a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> going on, the, the, it doesn't require big grand moments where there's spotlights and crowds and applause and you're applauding yourself in your own head. They can be almost unseen. They can almost be invisible moments, but not to you. And so that moment where I held this, to someone's throat wouldn't have been visible to me today if I hadn't have, after the fact, considered what someone had just let me do, someone had enabled me to do, and then realized that I can freaking do anything I want if someone lets me. So finding the right crew that lets you do rad things can really help your creativity, I think. 100%. I think this is the, the key that I wanted to touch on was the fact of the environment really does play a major role. And to your point, Sean, I think the, uh, the ability to reflect on it then gives you the ability to look at it at, at as, as a creative process. So for instance, um, I got tasked with making a, um, like a map model, like a 3D map model for one of the operations we were doing uh, as a training thing out in Chilliwack. And I spent, you know, I had a couple guys helping me and we spent a good 45 minutes making this map model of the lake and doing all the, the things. And the, uh, the CEO came up afterwards and he's like, man, who, who made this model? And I was like, me and these two dudes. And they were like, this is probably one of the best map models I've ever seen. Let's get to the briefing. And that was the extent of the, uh, the check mark that I got out of it. But it allowed me to, to go, wait a second, that was... It's a pretty creative process if you really stop and think about it. And uh, to that point, a lot of the things when you get out of the military, you don't really apply as being creative or as being what their extended capability is. I've talked to a lot of veterans who got out and say, oh, well, I don't know what kind of job I'm going to get because I was a machine gunner. Like, what kind of skills do I have? I can't apply that to anything in the civilian world. But you can. You just take a little bit of creativity to it and say, well, you have to manage your timings, you have to manage a weapon, you have to be crew, you have to be a good communicator so that everyone knows what's going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that you can then apply to your life outwards. And so I'm wondering, was there a point for any of you that you really were able to then utilize those skills and apply them to your creative process now versus prior to that where you just kind of were doing things without really realizing how creative they were. I'm going to start with Steve on this one. What do you think? Let me unmute here. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a really important point. Um, uh, I started out as a machine gunner uh, and then went to scout sniper platoon. Um, and all of those things that we talk about that we don't, at the time, you don't consider creative, like range cards or sketch. I that your comment, Sean, about uh, sniper instructors and their comments on your range cards uh, or your field sketches really resonated with me. <laughs> um, lots of uh, elevated push ups for not so good range cards. But uh, that's anyway, I digress. But what I try and tell veterans that I run into it, who say something similar to like, oh gosh, you know, I was just a machine gunner or hell, I was a mortarman. What, like, what am I going to do? Like, I can't, I'm not creative. I don't know how to do that. I, I, and I completely disagree with that. There are so many, there are so many times in the military where 
you have to look for work or you're unsupervised and you have to make things work because you have to improvise, adapt and overcome. Right. Um, and that is creative, even though at the time we we don't look at it as as creative. It's you know, it's not writing a novel or painting a picture or anything. But so I encourage veterans to like use all of those tools that you gained in the military about how to achieve goals, how, about how to accomplish tasks, you know, that that discipline, that work ethic and that grit and that determination. Um, did those are that's like your superpower bro like that is your superpower um and there's i don't believe that there is anything uh that a veteran cannot accomplish if they set their mind to it right um so if there is so you just need to sit in the quiet for a little bit and have a cup of coffee and really think about what are what are the things that trip your trigger right um, you know, if you want to be an underwater basket weaver, like, all right, let's start researching that and figuring that out. Right. Um, if you, you know, if you want to be a ballerina check, sounds good. Like I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do some ballet moves when I take the trash out on Thursday or whatever. Right. Like I, there's nothing that we as individuals who have been in the military can't do, um, because we know how to break down tasks into small bite-sized chunks and and accomplish them um so those those are the things that i was whenever i run into any kind of difficulty with creative process or pitching a project or rejection or any of those things i always go back to the foundations that i've built my life on and that's you know my marine corps manual that i got at paris island in 1989 the leadership steps and uh, you know uh, your five paragraph order, all of, all of that kind of stuff. Like I go back to those basics and go, okay, check. That didn't work out. Let's map it out. Let's figure out how we're going to get it done. Um, and, and I think that's, that's overlooked a lot um, when people transition, right? It takes like Gordo had said, you know, uh, what if it was like two years transitioning kind of thing. Um, you know, it takes, takes people a long time to kind of get their, wrap their head around that. Um, so I, I preach that all the time. It's like, dude, are you kidding me? Like you're a veteran. There's nothing that you can't do. Absolutely nothing. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, there's nothing quite like a good set of orders and that takes a lot of creativity sometimes to get a good set of orders. Taryn, what are you thinking on this? Sorry, I had to unmute there. I, I, I really honestly, uh, I completely agree with Steve. Um, I wouldn't, I, yeah, everything that I that I, I kind of learned from the military and built myself upon, just like Steve said, I, I apply that to my life now. So if I want to be creative, like Steve said, okay, what is it that I want to do? Let's research it. Okay, now let's break this down into how we're going to get it achieved. And I really do go back to everything that I was taught in the military. Um, I, I, I sometimes have a bitter taste in, in my mouth for... Um, for some of my time in the military, but um, not for, not for the or for for the right reasons, I would say. For I would not be uh, you know I would have not been able to grace uh, being on Team Canada for skeleton or you know going and doing doing um, Wayfinder Wellness the things that I thought I would never be able to do uh, once I learned you know tenacity that you know just the ability to move past whatever obstacles in my way, regardless of how hard it might seem, um, has just really allowed me to flourish in whatever it is that I want to do. Um, and I think creativity doesn't necessarily mean it has to be something that you're making physically, you know, like making a painting or, or building robotics. Um, creativity could be sliding down a, an ice track at first. It's, you know, whatever it is, but uh, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Steve said about the military. Yeah, absolutely. Gordo, what are you thinking? Yeah, um, probably in the same time frame as, actually no, probably like nine months ago is when I finally realized, okay, there's a structure to this. Um, structure to being creative as in it's your job. So you have to, if you design something, there's a creative process. It's the same thing that Steve and Taryn are talking about. 
and and chance about orders and performas and having a framework and that framework allows you to really maximize your creativity um it kind of sounds like the same thing that what you guys are talking about right now with with your own lives and i agree that there has to be a plan um but i found it interesting that it's the same that is the same theory essentially as the creative process you guys are talking about using it in your own lives um I don't know. I, I, yeah, I would agree. I, I use the same process. You have to do your research. You have to know what you're looking for. And only until you have the pieces in place, can you really fully maximize the amount of creativity that you want to do? Cause if you don't know, then you're, it's never, it's never the full measure. It's always a half measure. Cause you're, you're testing, you're testing, but you know, it's not the right thing. And then when it's, when you find it, it's, it's the full hundred, 150%. Um, but yeah, I didn't really recognize or realize that there is implementation for creativity. If you really, I think there has to be a point. If you're just create, if you're just creating, I don't know, like an artist maybe. Um, hmm. But I don't know. I still think that there's something underneath the artist that once they're done creating, they want to show it to someone and there has to be, they can't just do it forever. There's some way they have to survive. So having the framework to be able to figure out how can I make money? How can I make, how can I continue being creative requires like a framework. The end. <laughs> Sean, what do you think on this? Well, I quickly grabbed the photo and I'm gonna use it as a stage prop to make a point. So that's me doing a practice run on shredding someone's throat. And if I could do that easily, how could uh, picking up a pen and writing out a paragraph creatively as part of a story that I'm, I'm trying to write, how could that be hard? How can I do something so complex and costly to another person? How can I do that easily? but not pick up a pen easily. And I think it's because it's never explained to us correctly that we're capable of anything. Just as Steve said, that's, that's generally where I'm at right now. It's what I've said for quite a while, but I still feel like we're failing to help people understand that if, if you can do highly complex, real-time things, you're capable of anything. And if you don't believe it, it's our job to convince you that you are. And so I'm gonna use Chance's map model example, his story to build out what I've just said. And so at one point, as a young sergeant, we had a uh, reconnaissance patrolman competition in 3PPCLI. And anyone who's been out to Vancouver Island in the Victoria region, you drive about an hour away and you're in some of the most hellacious rainforest in the world. I mean, it's bonkers navigation. It's super freaking hard, man. And so um, this reconnaissance patrol competition, I had a team, my, my patrol team, that uh, we were going to compete for, for us to represent a large group of men. And we were competing a bunch other groups of men. And not only was it a matter of personal pride and regimental pride and team pride and all of that good stuff, but it was also an opportunity for me to make my team better, which is what I put as the first priority. Not to win. Win's an outcome. What we were doing in that moment, as far as I was concerned as a young Pathfinder, was me injecting my Pathfinder wisdom into younger bucks who would improve because of it. So it wasn't about the win. It was about making them better now to the map model. So I put my two IC, a young master corporal on the task of make a good map model. This is what I expect questions execute. And so him and his guys put together a pretty good map model. And I walked in and I looked at it and I said, scrap it, start again, not good enough. This is what I expect. They were so freaking bum, man. They poured their souls into it. And it wasn't acceptable to me. And it's not like anyone had a boohoo face, because they know my deal. But they were bummed, man. 
and they start from scratch. What was the outcome? It was a better model. The model was better, and they were more proud of their effort. By starting from scratch and making a better one, they could contextualize what more they had in them. And it was my job to expose that more to them. And sometimes that comes with a slap upside the head like, negative, that sucks, build it again now. That's just the way life is, man. If you are going to draw maximum out of someone, it takes a certain lever. And it's not always a little pat on the head and good job. Try better next time. Sometimes it's hard delivery. Do better now from scratch. And so we ended up winning the patrol competition for the battalion. And my guys were so freaking proud. Not of the win, though they were proud of that. They were proud of building that map for a second time. My two IC, weeks afterwards, every once in a while would tell me, Sergeant Taylor, building that map again was the thing that made us win. And I know that to be true, because a patrol is a patrol. But before the patrol crosses the start line, everyone's head's got to be in the game. Everyone has to pay a small price. It shouldn't be hand-delivered on a velvet pillow. It should have sting. It should resonate. It should feel like you earned it. And so rebuilding that map model was the best lesson they ever got, though they didn't appreciate it in the moment. And sometimes that's the way it is with creativity. It, maybe it shouldn't all be pats on the head and encouragement and good job, keep trying to paint that painting. Sometimes it's got to be a hard lesson as well. Like, man, if you don't pick up your socks, you ain't going to be a painter ever. And I know that's a harsh story to deliver to someone and you've got to be sensitive and you've got to be, you've got to read the situation well to deliver proclamations like that to use as a lever. But if you've been in the game a long time and you're used to creating change, then there's many ways you can do it. And it isn't always positive encouragement. That is a very good point. A lot of times you need to get kicked in the butt for you to actually realize the potential you have. Um, and on that note, I'm wondering, how would you, how would you teach this lesson to, to those that are either just getting into the military or have lived their lives and have never believed that they were creative to begin with, have always looked at creativity in the traditional sense in terms of painting or, you know, being an artist of some sort. Um, with how would you get across the point that creativity spans all tasks? How would you develop that in somebody that has really believed that they've never been creative their whole life? What do you think, Gordo? I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I would say uh, creativity is like the flair to life. When that person decides to choose what shoes they put on, and they always go, they're Jordan Air Force Ones with a certain color. That's being creative. When you make a certain dish that's your favorite and you put all this work and effort into it and it's good, but you know, next week you're going to make it better and you put the same amount of time in it again. The old school mentality that it has to be art or you're making sculptures and stuff. It's, it's not. There's creativity everywhere you look. You see it just like... Uh, Terrence said all over the internet, people being creators. Um, you see it in such simple things like Sean taking out his uh, trash. That's his moment. So I think when you point that out to someone as well, it's almost uh, a way to pull the focus to being present because you actually can see, whoa, do you see that cloud over there? I guess that's, that's not creativity, maybe in your mind, but if you point something that's normal out to someone, but it looks beautiful, then you really take it for that moment and see for what it is. I like that. Taryn, what are you thinking? Are you working the mute button? <laughs> there we go. Oh, can you hear? Sorry, I, uh, okay. my, my screen completely froze up on me there for a second. No worries. Um, yeah, I think also maybe we kind of all touched on um, a little bit of the upbringing of people. Some people have more of a creative upbringing with more engagement from their parents to encourage them to do those things um, where I didn't receive that. So going into the military, I really didn't have 
um, a creative lens on, as I guess I would I would call it. Um, so even what Gord was, you know, um, said, you know, X, Y, and Z, I'll, I may not have looked at that as creativity when I was in the military, and Gord was right, which obviously um, speaks to his create his creative lens and, and what he was able to see as creativity in the military. And I, you know, I, I would have loved to have Gord as a as a leadership for myself then, because I would have loved for somebody to be like, hey, like you are being creative, but and, and this is what it is. So maybe it's just a lack of um, of understanding of what the creativity was and not being able to see what it was in front of me. So um, be having good leadership that is, is able to uh, point out what that creativity is to you sometimes, I think would probably benefit a lot of uh, young troops kind of just getting into the military um, because it's a different mindset. And we, uh, you know, let's say you come from a very liberal background or for some, some how, how you got into the military, um, you could see it as, as a little bit stifling on the creativity side of things. So, um, yeah, just pointing it out, having good leadership around you to, to show you what the creativity is that you're doing. Um, I never saw map. <laughs> I, n- I never saw um, orders and stuff like that. It was creative. It's just, this is what we've got to do and I'm just going to do it kind of thing. Um, and I never looked at it that in that lens. So hindsight now hearing it from you guys, man, I wish I had my, a little bit of time back. Like maybe I would have done things a little, a little differently with, with that creativity. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, I, I'll, I also didn't see it as creative until much <laughs> later. So I feel like how does that, Steve, any thoughts on this? Yeah, but um, but bef- before I get into that, one, I just, I've been dying to, to get back to the Sean. Uh, I just have one request. So next Thursday, when you take out the trash, the dagger gag is what's going down. That's, that's what's going down. So I'm throwing that challenge like out there. It. I like it. Um, and with then, rotten garbage, with like yes. a bag of like <laughs> yeah. compost all over your driveway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what that's what I want to see. That's that's what the people demand. So, um, but I think like in in and in terms of what we were talking about, I think Sean was talking about, um, you know, the the create the creative piece and those those sorts of things, and he was talking about the the competition. It was like I wanted to touch on that too. Is like nothing, nothing that you do that you hold in any kind of high esteem, right, comes without a cost, right? If you didn't earn it, you don't care about it, right? If if everything, if there's, you've got to be willing to pay the price, right? And that's where, again, this is where I feel like military folks, veterans or will excel in any creative endeavor because we understand that right we understand there's a price to be paid and and nothing nothing worth having comes without that cost right so when i would talk to when i my advice to younger folks were to get them to understand that they are being creative maybe in that military environment or that structured environment right is is just pointing out that everything that you do is creative Right. You from from the from the minute you pop out of the rack, square your corners, make your rack, get your footlocker squared away, clean your weapon, polish your boots or whatever. You're creating an outcome. You're creating your life. You're creating your day. Right. Um, If you're doing a patrol, right, you're you're doing your maps, you're doing all that good stuff, planning your routes, all that stuff. You're creating an outcome. Right. And that's on you. So and and that could be so so like outside looking in, I think sometimes or or sometimes not outside looking in, but when you're wrapped up into it, you don't see that as creative because we all look at um you know, creativity is like like we've said many times, painting a picture, writing a book, uh, writing a song or you know, designing something, right? Um, but to me, like it's just you got to under have the understanding that you're creating your life, right? You you're the it's like uh, you know you're the master 
of your life, right? I'm not, I know I'm not quoting the poem correctly, but um, because the mat, like, uh, I don't know if you know Mike Pannone, old, uh, old Ricondo CAD guy. Oh, yeah. We know Mike. I think, so, yeah, like, like Mike always says, right? Um, the magic is there's, there's no friggin' magic, right? The magic's in the work you're avoiding. So, if you can, if you can get people to understand that, that hey, you're creating your reality, you're creating your life. Um, you know, it's like Sean with his yogurt protein bombs and everything like that. He's he's creating an outcome. He's creating his life, right? He's that's creativity, right? Uh, because he has choices there, right? We can you could eat a pizza or you can, you know, have your yogurt casein protein ice cream shake thingy, whatever, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that makes sense, but that, that's yeah. kind of, that's how I, that's how I kind of come at it. I like it. I like it. Sean, what are you thinking on this? Well, shout out to Mike. Cause he's a cool dude. We need to get that guy back on again. Lickety split. Um, and he's right, man. The, the magic is in the doing the magic is in the, actually, I, I think if Mike was on here right now, he might say the magic is in the stuff that no one gets to see. And so I'm going to make a point on that specifically uh, about myself last night. So um, I got this bad boy, that little diagram there that I've been thinking about for a little while. It's an achievable form of mastery. And I had four silos. I've talked about this in the past. I've been, I've been on a bit of a thematic approach for the last few weeks about pursue mastery. Life is about mastery in everything, always. As we're doing this podcast right now, I'm trying to do my best. I'll never master podcasting, but I'm in the pursuit of mastery. Sometimes I'll watch these podcasts later that night, and I'll just shake my head because I'm diabolically bad in that podcast. Like just, I feel like I'm stinking up the place. I feel like that was a freaking terrible podcast for me. I suck, but that's my imposter syndrome. I know it's not that catastrophe that I, I've got going on in my head, but it's, it, I'm never happy with my performance and I'm rarely happy with anyone else's performance around me. I always expect more of myself and everyone. And so back to this thing, cause I'm thinking about mastery right now. I'm trying to explain to everyone out there that you can achieve mastery, just not in one thing. No one can be a master in coffee, but you can pursue mastery in coffee. And I think for myself, I'm quite a ways down the pipeline of mastery towards coffee. Let's call it 73%. Doesn't matter what the number is. I've still got a ways to go, but I've learned a lot. But as I move down the pipe, I understand that I've got more to learn and that I'll never learn everything. And that's just life, man. So no one can ever master anything, in my opinion. And all of the masters that are out there, all the martial arts masters, all the freaking whatever masters that are out there, I don't think of them as masters. I think of them as people who are pursuing mastery. And they can call themselves masters, but they're not masters in my world. They're just really good at their job, maybe. Or maybe they're lying to themselves about how much mastery they've got. Doesn't matter to me. No one's a freaking master in my world. So pursuing mastery. How do you achieve mastery? Well, I think it's through several silos in your life. You get to create silos and then you get to add up that percentage as you get older. And you get to see if you have reached 100%. When you add all those silos together and to me that's mastery of life not mastery of a single subject if you do enough things in your life and pursue them relentlessly and get 27 percent here and 34 percent there and 66 percent over here you add it together now you're plus of 100 percent. now you've achieved some level of mastery in life that's my opinion so with that in place Last night, I was trying to draw that out using a mind map tool that I've got, and it wasn't working out. Spending a half hour on it, 45 minutes on it, almost an hour. By the time the hour came up, I was like, oh, this is garbage. And I deleted the entire thing. There goes an hour freaking. 
I mean, I burned a gajillion calories, brain calories, trying to put that together last night, and I just couldn't pull it together. And I stood up, went into the kitchen, grabbed a glass of water, sat down at my desk here again and thought, I'm going to give it another crack. And I tried to do it in a different way. I used a wire diagram, and then I used a different diagram, then I used a circle diagram, then I used a... I was doing all the diagrams, trying all sorts of different ways. And after two hours of working on it last night, I dumped the whole thing and thought, not good enough. I'll do it again another time. Because it, it wasn't lining up for me. Two hours of my time is a lot of time to not come up with anything. But did I come up with nothing? I came up with a process that got me closer to the outcome that I'm seeking, perhaps. And so the throwaway time isn't thrown away unless I ignore the time. But I'm not ignoring the time. I'm still thinking about it. Part of my brain throughout this morning wanted to desperately get to this job that's on my right flank here on my big screen and getting to work on creating that freaking diagram that is still haunting me right now on how to put it across correctly to enough people that they'll pick up what I'm putting down. So if I ever create that diagram, you'll all see it. But if you never see it, you'll know that it's constantly chewing away at the back of my PFC, my prefrontal cortex, to let me know that that itch needs to be scratched. And that's creativity, I do believe. The moment that you start feeling like there's something that needs to be done, but you don't know what it is, start thinking about what that itch is. But then the moment that you identify the itch, well, it's time to start scratching, baby, until there's no itch. And that's what I'm going to have to do with this diagram, is get rid of the itch. And it might take me a week or two. It might take me a year or two. It might take me the rest of my life. But that itch won't go away until it gets properly scratched. And the proper scratch is delivering an outcome that I'm pleased with. Because I'm not designing this to please you. I'm designing it to please me. But in so doing, I'm putting it out there for everyone else, not for me. So it's a weird juxtaposition in that I'm trying to create it for others, but it's got to satisfy me. I hope that makes sense. It, it really does. And Steve, yeah, you got a thought? Yeah, uh, that's very, very similar to, I don't know if you've read uh, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative Act. Um, but fantastic, highly recommended. Uh, and that's one of the things that Rick talks about as well is like, if, if you're, you've, you've got to let go of creating for the audience and create for yourself and create something that resonates with your, with yourself and create something that you're happy with, create something that you believe is your best work, best product. Right. And in that way, it will be authentic and authenticity resonates with people, right? They can, they can recognize themselves in you or in your work. Um, and that's how audiences uh, latch onto things. Um, so I think that, that was really interesting. You said that, Sean. I haven't read his book, but I have watched this year alone. I've probably watched a dozen of his uh, interviews with various personalities or uh, a number of podcasts that he's been on. And I, I'm just going to say it. He's probably my favorite dude this year. Some of the things that he said are things that, like, I, I, I feel like he's reading my mind. Like, Rick, are we the same? Sometimes I've thought that. But and, then and there's to, a, and, there's and other times where I've thought, like, oh, my goodness, I cannot believe that I didn't put two and two together to equal four, just like Rick has. Yeah. Like, it, he's inspired me. He's, he's confirmed me. He's kind of, to some degree, sh shaped or guided me a little bit. And he doesn't know me. I don't know him. But he's a random dude. Wherever he is right now out on the internet, he's a random dude that I've never shaken his hand, but has made an impact on me that goes far beyond a handshake. And so thanks for bringing up his name. And uh, it's cool that you recognize that, but it's important to the audience that's listening to this that 
if you find someone who moves your needle, freaking hang on. And it doesn't matter what their name is or what they do. I mean, when you look at Rick, he looks like a bit of a, a shaggy, freaking tree hugging. What does this dude have to say that is going to be relevant to her chargers? But he does. You just got to open your mind to the tree hugging sort of characters that are out there that can really move your needle. The, the traditional creatives, right? Steve, you got any other thoughts on this? No, I was just uh, uh, reflecting on how um, Sean's hair used to look a lot like Rick's. Um, but <laughs> that's that's all. That's all. Yeah, 100% it did. So I, I do want to get into this in terms of the, the creative process. And um, I, I do love the fact that you brought up Rick because I was thinking of one of the videos I've seen of him talk about very something very similar in the fact that... Uh, you know, comparison and all these other things have a, an effect on your artwork that you don't need, or it has an effect on your creativity that you don't need, et cetera, et cetera. But what, you know, you and I were talking about this beforehand in the green room before everyone showed up was the fact that the, the process in which you engage, engage upon when you're talking about creativity, I'm wondering for myself, it changes depending on what I'm doing. So when I'm doing a conversation like this on the podcast and I'm, I'm trying to creatively develop a conversation in the moment with the flow of how everything's going. Uh, I'm, I'm actively creating in the moment. But if I'm writing, then I will write a chunk. And then I have to stop myself from going back and editing that chunk that I just read or that I just wrote. Or if I'm drawing, then it has to be something else. Or if I'm playing the guitar, then it's a different process. But I'm wondering for you guys yourself, have you noticed that your creative processes are different for different creative tasks? Or do you find that they are it's the same process for any task? Taryn, I'm going to start with you. What do you think? That's a good question. Um, I I like to think I come at it at, at it with the same the same um, approach. Really, um, I think I need to research things and and learn and I have an understanding first before I can be creative because it. Uh, like like Sean, you, you're trying to create this um, this this kind of schematic or whatever it was that you're that you're trying to do for two hours um, with something in I, I don't know um, was it was it for you like what well, when I'm when I'm looking at what you were doing were you, um, were you coming at it with a, with a an idea in your mind or were you trying to stumble across the idea? Cause for me, I, I have a hard time with, um, well, I have ADHD. So if I don't come at it with some sort of methodology or some, some sort of approach where I am trying to figure out an outcome that I already know exists, um, I'll just go in circles all day long and I will end up with two hours of nothing as well. So for me, I really have to have some sort of understanding of what it is I'm trying to be or what I'm trying to create, um, yeah, to keep it simple. So I really do have to have some sort of um, um, scaled approach to what I'm trying to create. Yeah, no doubt. My uh, the, the process here is that I have an idea when we start, and then as soon as we begin, I'm like, okay, let's see where this goes. <laughs> and then I just run with it. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a little challenging sometimes. Gordo, how about yourself? What are you thinking? Yeah. Um... It's always, it is pretty much always the same, whether it's like designing something or even mission planning. I wrote down here, nine lines are free. Um, nine line is your targeting data that you give to an aircraft to like strike a target. And uh, the regular military way is very heavy on safety, which is, it's a real thing. You still respect it in soft, but the preparation going into the objective even when you're on the objective to see a target or a possible place for a bad dude and send that targeting data up to the aircraft even if nothing happens you are constantly like prepared and it's the same thing that i do with creativity is that i can't if i don't have a direction of how i'm gonna go then i will never like i said earlier never be able to give it the full measure so there's always some sort of pre-planning pre for me to then feel I've got these these barriers up that keep me in place. I know my left and right, and now I can give my full energy to it. Um, and I find 
the more I've, I think about it from your question, the more I realize like, yeah, that's been since mission planning. Once everybody has their tasks and you come up with the plan together, it's, I think in the business, they call it a typography, like kind of like an exhaustive list of things that could go wrong and not go wrong. And you drill that down until everybody knows the plan inside out. And when you finally feel comfortable with the plan, which is the soft way of like everybody doing the planning together, there are no more questions because everyone's everyone knows it inherently. And that's when you see the creativity is that like there's no more stress of like, what's my job? I hope I write it down in orders. It's like, no, no, no. Like everybody's built the plan. And now you're right. Maybe, you know what, how I'm going to breach that wall. Maybe I'm going to carry like this tool or that tool. And you have more space to flex your plan. But it all starts because you have your initial kind of baseline taken care of. And then you can go full into uh, creative mode. I really like that. Sean, thoughts on this? Or, yeah, Sean, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of like Gordo. And, and I agree with uh, his concept about special operations. Is It is a group effort. Everyone, uh, we... We used to call it a little bit of a planning parliament where everyone had their opinion and no one was uh, higher than anyone else in their opinion and everyone solved the problem equally as peers. At least that's the way it used to be when I was in the game. It could have changed since then. But what I found through that process, which was almost uh, diametrically opposed to the what I refer to as the regular military, is I felt like I had a say. And so having a say in my own path forward is really important to me. Now, I think it's important to everyone, but it's whether you feel like you've got a voice in the moment. And so um, that's an entirely different conversation, I suppose. But to Gord's point, um, you know, once, you're, once you know what's up and you feel like you've got room to move, room to maneuver, life gets a little bit better. And so that's that's when my life got better anyway. Once I realized that I'm an out-of-the-box thinker, we'll call it creative, and the roles that I started um, operating in, I was encouraged to think outside of the box, which was really good for me and really good for solutions, and help Sean understand that that's what I like doing. And, and, I, and not only do I like doing it, I, I create good results. That had to be cemented into my mind through the system. The system taught me that. I didn't know it until the system taught it to me. But once I understood that I could out of the box frickin' anything, my life got a whole lot easier, got a whole lot more creative. I just didn't think I was being creative. I just thought I was applying a process. Uh, but it's conversations like this, like Gordo just brought up, that make me realize or, or string the dots together that... I was taught a long time ago to be an out-of-the-box creative, and it doesn't much matter how I um, expose that to the world or how much I show that to the world, whether it's through writing or photography or in front of a microphone or whatever the case is. It doesn't matter how I do it. I just need to know that I can do it. I'm allowed to do it, and no one's wagging their finger at me as I do it. And so where's the harm? Where's the holdback? Where's the, where's the fear of being creative? I don't have it anymore, but there was a time when I felt like I was exposing myself to everyone. And I think that's perhaps just an ego issue where I, I felt like I was being vulnerable. <laughs> and that word doesn't fly with me, but I know it's a common word for everyone else out there. They appreciate it, a little bit of vulnerability. I just think of it as being a little bit more honest, perhaps. Um, so creativity, I think um, one thing that I stated about, to Gord's point, uh, creating a mind map or a wire diagram, or, or sorry, Terran, uh, a mind map or a, a wire diagram. Um, what was I thinking when I started creating that? I wasn't thinking about anything. This is what I thought. How am I going to do this? How am I going to present that to other people in a new way that's going to make them pick up what I'm putting down? Should I write about it? Should I take a photo of it? Should I try and draw it a different way? I wasn't sure. So here's what I did. Uh, you know what? I'm going to pull up Copilot. I'm going to use some AI. And here's what I typed in to, to start off the two-hour long version. I was going to create some AI art. And my AI descriptors were this. 
Visualize eight metal silos in a line out on a prairie surrounded by wheat. They are metal. They are stainless steel. It is late night. The sky is dramatic and there is a setting sun. That's the verbiage that I used to start creating the art. Because in my mind's eye, what I wanted everyone to see was a line of silos that disappeared off into the distance, surrounded by wheat with a dramatic sky. And then I was going to tell a little story. And it was going to be along these lines. Life is a wheat field that you get to harness, that you get to harvest. And how much you harvest is how much goes in those silos. And how many silos you have is the culmination of your life. So if you've only got one half full silo, you haven't harvested life enough. If you've got eight half full silos, congratulations. You're now in a broader game, living a fuller life. But you've still got half a silo to fill, so get to work. And so on and so forth. I built this little story out in my head before I even saw the imagery. But I couldn't create the imagery. I tried a hundred different iterations probably to create the image that I had in my head. And none of them satisfied me. So then I switched to mind maps. And then I switched to wire diagrams. And I switched to bubbles. And I switched it. Then I dumped the whole thing. But I can still see the AI art in my mind. All of the ones that I kept scrapping. Not good enough, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. And by the end of the night, nothing was good enough. But I can still see it in my mind. I still know what I was trying to say. I still haven't said it. Someday I'll, I'll be able to do that. But for now, the concept is what I started with. Not a visualized outcome. I just knew I had to do this, and I wasn't sure how to get there. But eventually I will. So however I do it is probably unimportant, other than I know I'll have to be freaking creative to get to where I need to go with the concept that I'm trying to put across. That's a very good point. I'm actually headed down to the ranch next week, so I'll take a picture of a bunch of silos and a wheat field for you. <laughs> I know a few places that are exactly that description. Steve, you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was listening to what Sean was saying about the silos and, and there were two things that I picked out of that conversation. One was him talking about uh, when Sean was talking about being vulnerable, um, which resonated with me because that is to, to me, whether you like that word or not, you call it being truth. But the, in, in my line of work, the contract that a writer makes with a reader is to tell the truth, Right. However, whatever that is, right, uh, whether it's ugly, uh, whether it's pretty, whatever, right, is is telling the truth. And in, and in that way, I'm I'm going to I'm going to resonate and reach people because how many like everybody here has different perspectives. Right. Because when we were talking about this um, backstage before we started, uh, Chance and I were talking about this is that my my perspective is based on my experiences everything i've seen everything i've done uh every everybody that i've come into contact uh each and every single one of us on this podcast right now has a different perspective right because taryn's experiences are not the same as mine and and, and vice versa right and they're not the same as sean's or gordo's or or chances, right? So we're all coming at things from a different perspective based on our experiences. But by being vulnerable and by being tr as truthful as we can with our work, right? We, your audience will recognize bits and pieces of themselves in your work and be attracted to that. Um, so that's kind of, I wanted to kind of touch on that vulnerability because I think like, well, I know, I know I'm doing good work when I'm writing and I'm kind of like, oof, wash. Wow, I don't know, man. Like that's pretty, that's, oof. some people might be upset with that, you know? Um, you know, when you write a line of dialogue, that's pretty, pretty harsh or uses some very choice words or, 
or speaks an uncomfortable truth that that most people, you know, are you know only whisper to themselves when they're in trusted company or whatever. Um, and then when you were talking about the silo, Sean, I almost think it in in my mind when you were explaining it to me and you were talking about what the silos were, stainless steel, wheat fields, and, you know, sunset. I mean, do you have to have an image? I, I, I like when in my writing, I always look at it in terms of painting pictures with words. And if you're looking at it to do, to do that in a public speaking, which I'm, which I'm thinking that's the angle that you're going, right? This is going to be some sort of public speaking or, leadership type lesson um, sometimes the best images are are described rather than shown because it allows your audience to in, in, inject their own imagination and inject their own experience right and it'll, it'll resonate with them even more so just a thought I, I really like that. And I, I definitely want to get into this concept of vulnerability because I think it's a, a key thing when it comes to creativity and creation. Uh, just recently, I was watching a video on Instagram uh, with, I think it's, it's a hobby, the uh, MMA fighter in Montreal. That, that's name's a hobby. Uh, he was talking about... For Ross? Fact, yes. For Ross, a hobby? Yes, yeah. that's him. Uh, and he was talking about um, the fact that a cross creates vulnerability. Because you have to square up your body, you open up one side when you throw across versus a jab being tight and in line with your uh, uh, with your bladed body, that kind of stuff. And it made me think of when you were talking about vulnerability the other day and saying, well, I don't really feel like I'm being vulnerable. I just feel like I'm stating what is. But that doesn't negate vulnerability, right? By throwing that cross, you are actively attacking the person, but by doing so, you are opening of vulnerability. And I think that's the the key point of creativity is to be authentic, to be vulnerable. We have to open ourselves up, not so much so that we can be hurt, but we have to open ourselves up so that you get the full measure. And that was one of the things that Javi was saying was uh, the cross generates power by creating vulnerability. So you have to, if you want to hit with power if you want to do powerful work you have to be you have to open up a vulnerability otherwise it's just a you know it's a little tap jab over and over and over again you can hit somebody with that all day long but if you want power you have to uh, be vulnerable what do you guys think on this one taryn i'm gonna come to you first what do you think uh yeah i mean just i'll t i'll use this the collective as an example um let's say pre to 2020, I, I really wouldn't be vulnerable in the public eye. Um, I was not open to showing my feelings or emotions, um, uh, imposter syndrome, whatever you want to call it. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't ready to make that, make that step forward. Um, but once I did, I met, I met so many people, uh, Sean and, and yourself are a great example of when I opened myself up and was vulnerable. And, um, I was no, I, I mean, I, I'm the river Viking for a reason. I, I, I wanted to show people, uh, veterans, uh, the, the power of cold water, um, and what it can do to you. But previous to 2020, I just wasn't comfortable showing that, that side of my, vulnerability my emotions my creativity to anybody and as soon as i started opening myself up to that and showing um other people out, around me uh the more opportunity i had to, to to engage with people to spread that message to just get that out into the universe um just, your analogy is amazing by the way i love that <laughs> i love that you really physically have to open yourself up to the vulnerability in order to create that power um and yeah that that's my own experience um just being my authentic self and, and just kind of i think the age of the creator has 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 allowed me to to tap into that because the more i see more people being vulnerable the more um, i want to be that as well so yeah i think that's bang on 
Absolutely. Love it. Steve, what are you thinking? Yeah, I I mean, I 100% agree with that. I mean, I, I think you the more vulnerable I am, the more I write things that like literally make me feel like I'm standing in the middle of my high school naked, the, the better off I am, <laughs> the better the writing is. The more people go, oh, man, that was really cool. Like, I remember this one time, this, you know, every every time I do that and I kind of go, oof, um, it ends up working out. Um, and, and I think being authentic and vulnerable or whatever you want to call that um, allows for this kind of stuff, right? Like my relationships have improved. My friendships have improved. My networks have improved um, because it's like, hey, man, like, oh, this is a real dude. Oh, hey, I'm I'm talking to a real dude. Like, cool. Like, what's your deal? Uh, and, and being open to those kind of experiences. Um yeah, I, I think it's just overall it's made my made my life better. So um I a hundred percent agree with that. And and it makes and I think it 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 gives your when you talk about vulnerability creating power, it gives your words more weight, right? Because you're not you're not being inauthentic. You're not saying, Hey, like, uh, it's all sunshine and rainbows over here all the time. Um, I'm always cranking out pull up PRs and uh I'm, I'm crushing my, you know, uh, ski erg every day, you know, some days it's not like that. Um, and, and when you're, when you admit that and you're open about that, you know, like, Hey, today was a day. I just kind of like curled up in a ball and took a nap. Um, that happens. And, and people respect that because they're like, Oh, that, that's very similar to my experience. Right. Or I know people who've had that same experience. So that resonates with folks. Yeah, absolutely. Gordo, what are you thinking? Yeah, what Steve said, um, the best things come when you are unsure and you're like, oh, I don't know if this is, when you feel vulnerable, it's true. It feels opposite. Um, but I find the exact same, I find it's the same way that I can, when I lean into it, as uncomfortable as it is, uh, I get better results and more efficient results. You have to jump. I find that's like the big one. So for a different angle on this, um, when the light goes green, like you have to go. So when you keep that creativity to yourself and you're scared and you don't release it, that's when I think um, it's not as, as effective. So lean into the vulnerability everyone the things that don't make the most sense work pushing i say luck breeds luck people don't like luck i'd say good good pushing good energy will bring back double the amount of energy and it's the same thing with the vulnerability the more you lean into it the more you feel uncomfortable that's it's generally meaning you're heading in the direct direct the right direction i like that john what are you thinking so there's a difference between being um, authentic and flaring out. And so that's where my struggle lies, trying to find the right balance between letting people know various parts of my life without feeling like they'll misinterpret it as me being braggadocious. And that's why no one on the internet until yesterday has ever seen me kick a freaking zombie in the neck. No one's ever seen that. That's, that's the first time anyone got to see me kick someone in the neck. Being, I've been kicking a lot of neck throughout my life. Just no one ever got to see it. And so yesterday was the first zombie neck kick. It's like a Christmas present when I get to see something like that from some dude who I've been following for a while and I'm like, what? You can freaking kick a zombie in the neck, bro? How come I didn't know that? And so I love the Christmas present moments in a dude's life where I get to unwrap the Christmas present from that dude who's been in my life a few years and all of a sudden he unleashes the zombie neck kick. Where did that come from? I love when someone's got something in their back pocket as a skill set 
and no one gets to see it for a few years. And then bam, there it is right in your grill, right in the neck. And so I think that there, for me anyway, there's a line where like even talking about this feels braggadocious. There's a line between what you can do and what you can pretend you can do. And I like to keep it real. I know I've kicked lots of neck, so I got no problems with putting that out yesterday. My problem is what others out there will think of it. They'll consider it as a flare out. Now, does that make me lose sleep at night? Nah. I'll, I'll, anyone's opinion out there who thinks that I'm a Chad who can't do the things that I do. Cool. Cool story, bro. Uh, but I can do what I do and I've been doing it a long time. I just don't like when people who I care for or people whose opinions I respect or people who I think highly of might look at something that I do and think that's a flare out. That's been a lifelong struggle for me. The line between keeping it real and the concern about someone misinterpreting what I just do on the regular. So I'd be curious as to what you guys think. Mm, that's a very good question. Gordo, I'm going to come back to you. What do you think? Yeah, I think as long as you're leading with pure of heart and an intention, that leads to authenticity. If you can, if you know what you're doing comes from a good place, then I don't think that is the best part about being authentic is that you can just throw that shit right in someone's face and be like, whatever, dude, that came, that came from where, where it should be. Um, I have thought about the whole social media and how you present yourself and now like these webinars have gained traction and it's like, I'm, there's important people, there's doctors, there's respectable people. And I spoke with the VAC minister last week, we're talking about operator syndrome, telling her about different modalities. And it's like, Oh, the old Gordo, I struggle all the time. But the, the two things, I guess, one, I lead with Gordo. So that's, and what Gordo is, is a guy that knows that he doesn't know things. There's things I know, there's things I don't know, and there's things I don't know that I don't even know. And as soon as you tell that to someone and say, I don't know, but like, I would like to find out, that's when things, the barriers get broken and people can see, hey, this guy's like coming from a good place. And on top of it, I'm not trying to own it. I'm trying to own Gordo, I'm good at talking and I can swear well and do funny jokes and stuff. But um, knowing my limits and saying that out loud, uh, immediately drops the tension with people that's a great point steve what are you thinking yeah it's interesting i i never i i, I think I, I i understand where sean's coming from i like there's um you know i i think we all have had experiences and done things that like i, I don't talk about my military experience on the internet i don't talk about um uh, my law enforcement experience on the internet, um, even with my uh, writing, like I'll talk about writing and I'll talk about screenwriting, but I don't talk about um, people that I meet with or people that I'm uh, working with or maybe having a project with or anything like I, I try and I, I keep that to a very, very bare minimum. I mean, sometimes I think like maybe I should do more of that, um, you know, as kind of like um, brand building, marketing, social media nonsense or whatever. But um, at the same time, I don't like I feel like dropping some of those names um, and that sort of stuff is is to Sean's point is is braggadocious, right? Or flaring out or whatever you want to call it. And I, and I think there's enough of that from the veteran community as it is. I think there's a lot of folks um, from my community and other American military communities that I see on the internet that I just, and I, I just shake my head and go, oh, uh, it feels embarrassing to me. Um, you know, and, and yeah, it's it's I don't know. It's interesting. It, there is a fine line. I, I agree with Sean. There is a fine line because I want to. Hey, here's me. This is what I'm doing, uh, but also not wanting to to come off as um, you know one of those guys. Hey, look at me. Look at me, and kind of 
uh, you know, we call them toppers, right? Like the guy who you tell a story or you relate something and then the topper comes in and he's like, oh yeah, I've seen, and he did it twice on Sunday and he actually invented whatever it was you were talking about, you know? And I don't want to be one of those guys. So I would rather like do a lot of my stuff in silence. And then when you see that big result, hopefully of, of whatever goal I'm working towards, then you'd be like, Oh, wow. Cool. Like that's what that dude was doing. Um, you know, like I, I took a month off from Instagram. I was gone for a month because I was working on projects. I was working on deadlines and things like that. So, um, you know, and, and I was, you know, working with it. I told Chance who I was working with, but that's not something that I advertise and that's not something that I'm going to advertise. Right. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I'm rambling at this point, but, um, but yes, I agree with Sean. <laughs> it, it is a fine line and uh, it, it's interesting. I'm going to get into another point here in a second, but Taryn, what are you thinking on this? Yeah, uh, I think um, really if you, if there is a fine line and I think it's pretty easy to see whether or not that person is crossing that line um, of being genuine and authentic or, uh, flaring out. I, I actually, I've never heard that term, but I like that term, Sean. So I'm going to use that. Um, I think there is a, you, you, you can tell you, you can know whether, uh, somebody's intentions are, are the right ones or the wrong ones, just based on how, how they, 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 um, how they present themselves across to other people. And I, Sean's a great example of this. Um, he has a lot of imposter syndrome, but I'm, you know, um, as a as a, uh, a measly, I'll say measly, infantier. I mean, you're the sh right. You're I call you Master Splinter, and I joke with you about, and I call you that sometimes, right? But that's what you are, right? You're 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 the guy, um, but you don't you don't come across as that the guy. You come across as just another just another guy in the sense of. Um, you're not here boasting, you're not flaring out, you're just being you. And you can tell that when somebody is not being them and when somebody is is uh, trying to peacock. So um, yeah, there's definitely a fine line between that. And I just think people have an inherent uh, sixth sense about when somebody is, when you get a salesman that when you walk in to buy a vehicle and they ask you questions, you know right away, is this guy's here to make a, a deal or this guy is genuinely here to, to hear what I have to say and make make sure I'm um, purchasing the right vehicle that fits my family economically or however. So yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. It's a, uh, it, it's a, it's an interesting concept and I, I want to touch on a few things that you guys have said here. So bear with me, but the, uh, the salesman tactic, uh, I, I was in sales for a little bit when I was uh, younger and I made more sales by just being a genuine human being and wanting to talk to people than I ever did trying to sell something. The moment I tried to sell something, it turned people off. Most people didn't want to be there unless they came in specifically to buy something, in which case all I had to do was like open a cabinet. Like that's not me making a sale. Right? That's it. And I think that the authenticity of engaging people as human beings is the key proponent. And I, to this point about flaring out the people of, who are out there espousing things that perhaps they're not, it's usually because they're trying to sell something. Right. It's usually because they're trying to create an image or an avatar or persona, something that they are not quite or aren't anymore. And they're still trying to sell it in order to gain some sort of benefit from it. So it, it's a it's a tough one. Gordo, you got a thought? Yeah. Um, with a lot of the young guys in college, both young, I guess, guys and girls, they we were doing an interview process to get ready to go become graphic designers. And everyone's like, you're so comfortable talking to me. I'm like, yeah, 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 roger that. And I was trying to tell them that it's not – everybody has the skills. Ever, if you're applying for a job, then you probably know how to use Photoshop, Illustrator, et cetera. What people want and what they're going to hire is you. And so many people are scared that they have to be this other thing other than themselves. When it's like, no, dude, I want you to be like loving anime. You don't drink. You just drink like homo milk. You only do like – certain things i like those quirkiness and it's so hard for people to just relax and and be that person because they think it has to be something else it's it's so strange to see it is hard to, to be okay in your own 
skin and it's hard you want this outer pleasure and you want the outer praise but it's the moment you are comfortable with who you are with your gordo the moment things become a lot more chill with people yeah 100 percent. taryn what do you got I cannot remember where I was watching this, but uh, it was yesterday, actually. And there's this exercise that this woman was doing, uh, which is called, uh, I mean, essentially, it's a a rejection exercise, uh, where she basically went out and she laid on the ground on a yoga mat on, like, one of the busiest corners of her city or town that she's living in. Uh, And she's been doing this with um, her, her therapist. And essentially what it does is people are, people are just going to look at you ridiculous for laying out in public in the middle of the, the sidewalk where you shouldn't be doing this. Um, but it, it, it takes away and erodes um, your fear of rejection and what other people are going to think of you. So she literally laid out there for like six hours. Um, and this was something that her therapist. So I'm actually thinking about doing something ridiculous like that just to just to see what that effect is on me as an individual. But yeah, what, what, what Gord was saying is people care too much. So maybe look into something like that. If you're one of those individuals who, uh, you know, just feel like everyone's judging you, try and look at some sort of rejection um, exercise that will get you kind of out of that, that flow of mind. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, it's interesting. I don't know about laying out in the street for six hours. Hey. That, that, that's just me. <laughs> no. I don't know. <laughs> On the sidewalk, I should say, not in the middle of the street. If you're in the okay. middle of the street, uh, you deserve to be run over. <laughs> <laughs> sidewalk too, that works too. But it's interesting. I think Sean and I had this conversation a little while ago about um, the the idea of you know whether or not people judge you or whether or not you know you should be uh, comparison and, or comparing things and whether or not this should be a a benefit or a detractor or whatever. And I think it was Sean, but I'm not entirely sure who said this it was like, everybody's going to judge you for about 10 seconds and then they're going to move on. And because we all have lives, we all have things to do, right? We see people on the street waving signs and doing protests and all kinds of stuff. And you're like, wow, that's silly. And off you go. And that's the extent of the judgment, right? Is for the average person, you might judge something for about 10 seconds. And after that, you're not really going to think about it anymore at that point. Sean, what do you got? Yeah, so that is that is the case for a lot of life. And that's for people who aren't in your life. That's that fleeting moment like, that. what a loser. What a freaking hero. What a jerk. What a cool dude. Those are all the fleeting moments in life. That's because they're not in your life. But we have people in our lives. Like, you guys are in my lives. And so here's what I want to say for the people that are in your lives. They're the ones that are leaving the impressions. It's not the Chad on the street corner with the sign that says something that irritates you. It's the people that are actually in your lives that leave the mark. And so the mark, like Gord said, he got to speak with uh, veterans affairs, Canada minister, Uh, you know, that's good stuff to know. That's good stuff for all of us to know. The people who follow Gord should know that. That's not a flare. That's important. And like it might feel like a flare to Gord. It might feel like whatever it feels like. But it's important that I know that he got that opportunity. Because then it tells me a bunch of things about Gord. But more importantly, it tells me more about the system surrounded by Gord. And how it is possibly supporting him. And so... Same with Taryn, same with Steve, same with Chance. All of these things that are little moments that we might think, uh, I I don't want to expose myself out there. I don't want anyone to know that I had a conversation with dot, 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 like Steve. I don't want anyone to know I'm collaborating on a project with this individual, dot, dot, dot. Well, he's got his reasons, but I want to know. And here's why I want to know. Because I want to know that we all have a chance to speak with people that we are speaking to. I want, I want to know that every human that I know has the opportunity to have the opportunities. And what are the opportunities to speak to the minister, to work on a project with a dude who's large and in charge, to dot, dot, dot. I think 
in order to inspire, not influence, but in order to inspire someone to go out and be inspiring themselves, they have to see a result. It's not just one way, 100% inspirational fuel with no outcomes. The outcomes are what reinforce the fuel burn. The outcomes that I get are fueling someone else to light up the jets and freaking get hard and get after it. I think we're supposed to, every once in a while, inform the people who know us or love us that we are dot, dot, dotting with a certain person or doing a certain thing in order to encourage others that if I can do it, freaking hell, you sure as hell can do it. That is a great point. Steve, you've been quiet for a little while. Any thoughts on any of this? No, no, I feel like I I need to say something now. So, <laughs> but I, I it's, inter it's interesting that you bring that up because a lot of like my coming like from the, 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 the Marine Scout Sniper platoons, you know, it's like no target indicators, like you move in silence, like all that kind of stuff. Like that's very much ingrained in me. Right. Um, and, and, you know, to our, to our point about talking about vulnerabilities, like a lot of times you don't, I think when I, when I was listening to what Sean was saying, I was thinking about, I hadn't spoken about why I took that month off or anything like that. And I was like, well, that, that goes to our conversation about vulnerability earlier, right? Like the power comes from being vulnerable and being open about those things. So, um, so what I will say is that uh, I had co-written a script uh, with a good friend of mine, Kurt Johnstadt, who wrote a little movie you might've watched uh, called 300. Um, and Kurt's my mentor, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt and I've known each other probably 25, 30 years. And he's the one who brought me in the business. Um, and uh, so Sean Penn is reading our script and we're hoping to get Sean on board and attach to it and, uh, and get this thing off the ground. So that is the, there you go. That's my vulnerable moment right there. That's my cross. As Dude, I hope you're talking about you're hoping to get Sean on, not Sean Penn. Sean no, yeah. I think Sean, the throat ripping, <laughs> garbage dragging, <laughs> meat eating Canadian dude. Yeah, there you exactly. Go. Exactly. He fights bears every once in a while, too. If yeah. You go back a few videos. He's uh, we got one fighting bear. And, you know, to this point, this is an interesting thing that uh, I've been trying to remember what started the whole Thursday uh, garbage thing. And I remember now it is there were some people commenting to Sean about how out of this world he was. He was, you know, riding down his riding down the mountains on his on his mountain bike. And he was just smashing things out with the podcast and every, he was doing his own live. And everyone was just like, man, like, just look at you go. Well, it's well, yeah, you're Sean Taylor. Well, yeah, you're Sean. And it started becoming kind of a rote thing where people were just stating as if he was supernatural. And he's just like, well. I take the garbage out on Thursdays, just like everybody else. And that's where it started. <laughs> and then it started kicking off from there. And it's the reason I bring that up is that it, it seems like an innocuous kind of a throwaway statement, kind of a, um, oh, well, yeah, whatever. I mean, well, just look at him. Well, yeah, look at him, look at what he's doing. And that's, I think the point in terms of creation is that it's not about, it's not about creating something for somebody else. The act of creation, at least in my mind, is the ability to get somebody else to see what is in my brain. Because as we've all said, we're all different. We all have different perspectives. We all have different uh, backgrounds, interests, things like that. But if I can share just a little piece of my reality with somebody else, then I feel like I've succeeded in life because I, my why is all about facilitation. That's how I look at life. So if I can facilitate information in a new way to somebody else and they can take it and go, oh, that makes so much more sense, then I've enlightened somebody else in the world. And I think that is the key to creation for me. So this is my last question for you guys. What is the key to creation for you? Gordo, I'm going to come to you first. What do you think? 
key to creation. Okay, let me write that down. What you just said, though, so you were vulnerable. You are scared to release your stuff. You did release it. You took the step, right? But that's letting go. And I wrote down letting go equals creativity. So submitting, coming to terms with it, letting it go, telling people your, your audience and, and being vulnerable in it. Once you've done that, that's when creativity can flow. Your question about was key to creativity? Yeah. What's yours? My brain is so crazy, man. <laughs> I can come back to you if you want. Yeah, sure. I'll sit on it. Okay. Steve, what's the key to your creativity? Uh, key to my creativity? Uh, I would say coffee the, for the most part. Um but uh, yeah, I don't I don't know what the key to my creativity is. I, I I just feel the pull and the urge to tell stories, um, and the key to making that happen um, is applying those military principles of, that uh, of self discipline and breaking down those tasks. Uh, kind of into those, you know, one, one bite of the elephant type moments um, and, and being taking that, those lessons that I learned in the military of, of being self-disciplined and applying it to that process and being willing to pay the price, uh, being willing to, to play the long game, being willing to suffer. Um, we all know how to suffer, right? We've all done it, right? And we're good at it, right? Because we're here, Right. Um, but that, that is, is a key for me. That's cause that's what gets me through my days. Cause most of the time I'm not sending a script to Sean Penn, right? Um, most of the time I'm in my office by myself, uh, writing by myself, uh, uh trying to come up with a new idea by myself and, you know, that sort of stuff. So, um, it's the key for me is, is that work ethic and that self-discipline, um, allows me to open up and, and let that creativity flow. So. Absolutely. Taryn, what are you, what's the key to your creativity? Um, I need to be passionate about it. I, I said earlier that I have ADHD. So if I don't genuinely have the, the drive or passion to do what it, what it is that I'm, I'm about to do. My creativity does not flow um, because I am checked out. I don't, <laughs> I could care less whether I achieve this or not, or that I'm creating something new. But when I have something that, like Steve said, that I feel a pull towards, or I feel just drawn to do, um, I just, it gets my create, my creative engine going. Um, Policy might be boring for most people, but I think we have a lack of civic ed education in our country and, and I'm sure in the United States as well. Um, and that's what I'm passionate about is educating people on how our civic, our federal government uh, is supposed to work and what policies, uh, which most people are bored about. But I want to educate people because I feel like there's just not enough education and understanding about what uh, as citizens our duty to uh, to hold our government accountable and we don't really harp on that in our school systems anywhere so for me it's passion um, I need to I need to just get excited about it if it doesn't excite me chances are I, I'm not going to be very creative and, and, and interested as, as blunt and um, as cut and dry as that might be that's that's my my key to creativity yeah no it makes perfect sense Gordo you got uh, some time to think now? What do you got? Yeah. I put down no bad ideas. That's the key for me. Just send it and then you'll whittle it down from there. But shoot, let it go. No bad ideas. That's it. Just keep her pumping. Love that. Sean, key to your creativity? Key to my creativity is probably realizing where I am in life right now and understanding what I'm trying to accomplish right now. I'm not trying to live a young life. I'm not trying to live a life in the future. I'm trying to live the life that I'm in right now. And my life right now happens to be trying to help people. And so I'd alluded to it earlier in the conversation when I was talking about uh, telling my 2IC to scrap that map model and build it better. That's what I do in life, man. I, I love to see someone do better. 
I love to see them see themselves in a new way for the first time. I like seeing someone's eyes change when they realize they're a better person than they thought they were a second ago. And so that's, that's my jam, is introducing people to a better version of themselves. And how can I do that? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm trying to do it in a bunch of different ways. It is trying to be inspiring to some degree, but that's not the central theme. The central theme is just trying to expose people to the better versions of themselves. So that's enough for me is not just being helpful, but showing them a better version of themselves. That is what it is for me now. That's kind of what it used to be back in the day. Will it be what I'm into in the future? I don't know. I don't know what next year will hold. I don't even know what's around the corner this afternoon. But I'm okay with that because my central theme of just trying to be helpful is enough to make me face what's around the corner and sneer at it and kick it in the throat and say, bring it. Or whatever life brings for me as a challenge or as a threat or as an opportunity or as a whatever is around the corner, I'm okay with it. In fact, I relish it because it'll probably help me accomplish my central theme mission, which is try to make people better around me. Which is a great theme to have. And uh, I, I would love to carry this on, but unfortunately we have to shut her down for the afternoon. So let's, let's get some... Get some final thoughts on anything we've talked about, creation, creativity, vulnerability, any of the key frames, or if there's anything still bur burning in the back of your brain there, uh, anything at all. Let's start with Taryn and work our way down. Final thoughts? Uh, no, uh, no, no real uh, deep thoughts here, but uh, thanks for having me. It's been a, a minute since I've been on this podcast, um, and I've missed, I missed this energy, so I just wanted to, yeah say thanks for having me on and um this was a cool this was an introspective conversation that i'm gonna <laughs> reflect on after this after this podcast good that is the entire plan <laughs> steve you got any uh, final thoughts yeah sure um i i'd like to i i would second taryn's thoughts uh, appreciate being back on um was happy to be invited back on, um, enjoyed the first conversation. And again, uh, just like the first one, this one's been amazing. So, uh, pleasure to meet you guys, Gordo and, and Taryn. Um, and, uh, you know, just good to, good to hang with some, some good folks. Right. Um, and then to echo Gordo's comment about, you know, full send, right. No bad ideas. Like that's, what the phrase that I use in my business is um, you cannot ed edit a blank page, right? So throw it out there, right? Like put it out there, it, whether whether you're writing or not or whatever, whatever your thing is, like, like you said, Gordo, like green light, got to jump, bro. Like do it. And then you make your adjustments along the way. I mean, and we've all we've we've all done that, and we're still doing it. Um, and and you know, like Sean was saying, like I don't know what will be around the corner tomorrow, um, but I know that the effort I'm putting in today is the best that that I've got for the day, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's my final thought. Love it, Gordo. What do you got? Yeah, as usual. Thanks for having me on, guys. Great to meet you, other guys too. I'm sure we'll stay in touch. Um, I would just lean into letting go that they say in psychedelics, you kind of have to, you have to let go. The only rule is it's like riding a roller coaster, try not to get off in the middle of it, um, and submit. And I think that's like a hard, hard thing for anyone to do, let alone special forces guys try to, what we found out with Jen last week about trauma is that like, that's it. There's a, there's a control component to it. And when you don't have control and you try to get it back and that even includes not letting yourself go and putting out the art you have or the idea you have because you're scared, let it go. Just let it go. And it's so worth it. It's so freeing. The creativity 
not only with like art, but just in your life will be so much better. You will feel so much better because you don't have to worry about anyone else and you shouldn't worry about anyone else's opinion. It should be who, who you are is happy with you. You can look at yourself in the mirror and say like, yeah, I like that dude. And it feels good. You know, when you, when you, when you try to put stuff out into the world that it's coming from a good place and, uh, it feels amazing. So let go when the light turns green, get your ass out there craft. Do not stand in the fatal funnel. Keep going. Love We're it. born. I'm pretty sure there's a, uh, there's a song about that, letting it go or something of that nature. Yeah. Anyway, I'll have to look that up. Sean, you got any, uh, final thoughts? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. So, you know, creativity, as I look at the panel right now, it's four different dudes who've got to this point where we're all sharing a microphone together, all sharing a moment together. And, and we've all come at it from probably significantly different trajectories, other than the common trajectory of human existence. We could have all ended up in radically different situations where none of us were speaking. And, um, and I think that's an interesting part of life, man. Um, you know, we create this life. That is an act of creativity. This moment that we're all sharing right now was created by each one of us individually and created as a group collectively to all share this moment. And I think that shouldn't ever be overlooked is where you're at right now, as you're listening to this, you put yourself there. You put yourself listening to this. If you've gained anything from this, congratulations. You created that new learning. If you feel creative after this podcast, congratulations. Own your wise choices of listening to this podcast and feeling more creative. If you don't feel creative after this, that's also okay. But know that sometime in the future, I'll be annoyed. I'll be freaking irked if we spent two hours talking about creativity and I didn't, at the very least, I'll, I'll take ownership. I didn't help inspire you to do something new for yourself. Be proud of who you are. And in so doing, maybe that ripple on effect will help those around you. So um, this creative po podcast that's got some creators together will hopefully inspire you to be creative. Mm, beautifully put. I, uh, I really, I have nothing else to add to that. So I'm just going to say, go create something, anything. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter whether you show it to anybody else, just create. And once you've done that, look at it, decide whether you want to continue creating and then do that. But as long as you're doing your best in that moment, I can't, I can't think of anything wrong in that situation. That is you expressing yourself to the utmost and everything about that is right. So keep creating. We'll see you all next week. It's been a great. So as we all continue to learn, build and grow, there we go. I brought it back. <laughs> see you all next week. Chivo. Chivo. Hey collective, Big Bird here. Thanks so much for watching the episode. Really appreciate the support. It has been fantastic recording these and having these conversations. I can't thank you enough. If you'd like to watch any other ones, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, if you'd like to listen to another awesome convo, I got one right here. Got one right here. Your choice. Chimo.